When I was in the elementary school, elementary Sunday school, put it that way, elementary Sunday school, we learned a chorus, love, 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 the gospel in one word is love, Love your neighbor as your brother or sister. Love, love, love. Have you, have you sung that here? Have you learned that here? Love, 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 love. The gospel in one word is love. Love your neighbor as your... And the boys will say, brother, girls will say, sister. Brother, sister, love, love, love. Maybe it's a Baptist song. I don't know. <laughs> Love. Our Christian theology, biblically informed, undergirded, is solidly grounded in love, framed, framed in love. It's almost like tree is rooted in love. And the branches bears the fruit. Does it make sense? Yeah. And so, and so, Christian theology, biblically informed in the teachings of Jesus, expounded by Apostle Paul through his readings, is rooted. In love. And therefore, anything that comes out from that roots must bear wonderful, delicious, luscious fruits. That is how I see the gospel. That is how our lives must be stirred and given a direction and purpose. Yeah, it's love. And so, and so, um, none of us should pay attention to any opinions that is otherwise. As Christians. My parents have bamboo patches, groves in three different areas of their property. Some are about this big, some are this. In the monsoon season, we have this heavy rain and wind. And from the bedroom you can see those tall bamboos swaying back and forth. Sometimes you just think those bamboos might just crack and fall. But they are so strong. Their roots are so deep. No matter how hard the wind blows, when the wind stops, they go back to their original standing. That is how, in my opinion, Christian life should be. You know, because we are deeply rooted. When storms comes our ways, and comes all, all the time for some of us, you know, we are never without storms in our lives. You know, but if we are grounded, storms will come and go. And you and I will say, through it all, God was there. Amen to that? Amen. 
Yeah, through it all, we can say, God was holding me on. God was holding me on. And I am here to say, God is good. All the time. All the time. There we go. That's, that's what it is. That, that's what it is. And, you know, Christians, because of this biblical solid understanding, Christians, over centuries, we have gone out of our ways to be in ministry in situations that is so challenging and difficult, and yet, circumspectly, we have done it. Does it make sense? Yeah. Even in Myanmar today, Christians are out there. Churches are praying. Yeah. And still doing what must be done. You know? If we don't, who will? Right? In my Facebook for Myanmar, because the schools are closed and it's an exam time, you know where they are? They're in jungle, appearing their exams. Doesn't it make you want to cry? They have no classrooms available, no roofs over their head because somebody is against them. And so they're appearing, jung appearing exams in the jungle sitting on the dirt. And teachers are standing at different you know, parts of that ground. People have gone out of their ways to do what is right. And so in the text, both the Ephesians and the Gospel, what we see in, in those two passages is that when sin becoming a prevailing culture. God didn't say, heck with you guys, I'm going. Right? God did not turn his back on us. I have worked so hard for you, and you're not going to listen, and so I'm done. Right? But passages tells us that it was the deepest desire of God to reconcile us back, to forgive so that the broken pieces can come together and be healed. Huh? That is what we see. And so, and so John's gospel, John's gospel reminds us this beautiful verse, John 3, 16, one of the famous, well-known, well-memorized verse in the Bible. Right? That's what I learned even when I was so tiny. And I still remember it in King James Version. But you know, a lot of us stops at verse 16 and forget 17. It is for God so loved the world. Yeah. Yeah. God loved what he created. In Genesis narrative, we say, read that, right? And at the end, what did God say? This is good. What I have done, what I have created with my hands, looks pretty good. You know? And so, God was willing to give his son so that 
we can be brought back. And for those who believe, have eternal life. And then 17 says, For God did not send His Son into the world to judge the world, to condemn the world, but to save the world. See? Condemnation is not the ultimate focus of God. In fact, condemnation is not the focus of this salvation story. It is to save. That's the focus. To bring us together is the focus of the gospel. And that is why we say gospel means good news. Gospel is love. How can love and hate coexist together? You with me on this? Yeah. Love, man. That's what, that's what it is. And that is what God was willing to do. John wants us to remember an Old Testament story from Numbers chapter 21. Children of Israel are distraught, mad. They are just discouraged. And so they come to Moses and curse Moses. They went to God and they curse God. Heck with you guys, kind of, you know. You brought us out of Egypt where we had, you know, even in oppression, we had food, we had water, we had places to stay. We had those wonderful garlics and bread and whatnot. And he brought us out here to the wilderness. To kill? To die? Uh, God was not happy. And so, God sends these fiery serpents. Right? You know the story, right? God sends his snakes. And snakes bit some of them some of them died and the uh, children of Israel comes back to Moses oh we are sorry we are sorry you know when something bad happens we also call 911 to God right We also do the same thing. We say, I'm sorry, God. So that's what happened in Numbers chapter 1, chapter 21. And so God says to Moses, take one of the serpents and put, put, a, put on a pole. And whoever sees, whoever, whoever turns around and looks at the serpent, symbol of their own sin, and confess, repent, and believe, they'll live. And so what do Moses do? Moses creates this bronze serpent on a pole. Here it is. And everyone who turned around and believed they lived and those who didn't they die right john is of course telling story how jesus will be crucified right jesus will be lifted up like that and for all of us who will turn around and look at our sins what the sins have done and repent and believe 
will have eternal life. Right? That's what John says. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, and... Um, John is basically trying to make us realize and understand how much God initiates to do what is best for us. Right? That's what we see in there. And so Apostle Paul, in his own understanding, he says, you know, without grace, without God, we're just like dead people. We're just dead. And dead people, no matter how much you talk to them, yell at them, scream at them, those dead people is not going to respond to you. <laughs> right? That's what Apostle Paul is saying. And therefore, God had to Show us grace. Redeem us through Jesus. So that grace becomes the prevailing narrative in the salvation story. And for by grace you are saved. It is not your work. Nothing that you and I do can earn God's righteousness. Nor, nor we can do any righteous work to earn God's favor. In fact, it says, our righteousness is like a filthy rags. Oh, that's kind of scary. You know. So... We don't have to, we have anything to brag about. Grace. Love in the Old Testament is not this mushy gushy that we talk about. Right? We romanticize too much. But in the Old Testament, understanding of love is loyalty. Loyalty. It's about, it's about loyalty. Our loyalty to God. Because God is loyal to us as well. It's, it's, isn't that interesting how these two passages eventually comes together to tell us God's story of love. For us. And so, and so Apostle Paul is saying in Ephesians that because God has done so much good and he created us to do good, that means God wants us to be his hands and feet, just like the anthem from last Sunday. God has no hands. God wants us to continue to do what is good. I think uh, in the Ephesians text, we read that God created us, made us so well that we should, here is the word I'm looking for, we are God's accomplishment, created in Christ Jesus to do good things. How about that? God's goodness cannot die in us like a dead sea. No outlet. God's love that comes to us should flow out from us. Ah, powerful stuff. So, on this Amkor Sunday, 
We as a United Methodist Church have come together to do what is good. We don't go and brag about. It is not about attention getter stuff, but it is doing what is best for humanity. Does it make sense? That's what it is. You know, every once in a while in war torn countries, in a very bad disaster area, <laughs> CNN will show sometime this big truck, white truck with Amcor written in red going by. And I say, that's us. United Methodist Committee and Relief at Work. In fact, there is, a, there is a word out there in the land. After everything happens, M&M stays to help rebuild the city, the community. Methodists and the Mennonites. It's not M&M dinners. <laughs> it is Methodists and Mennonites stays back after Salvation Army is gone, Red Cross is gone, you know, uh, what else? You know, uh, FEMA is gone. It's the Methodists and the Mennonites stays back and puts the community together. We are trying to do something good for the broken world. That's what who we are. Our theology is absolutely clear. This is who we are. We cannot be otherwise. In the anthem you will hear from George, people like darkness. We escape the darkness. Sometimes we feel more comfortable in the darkness. How long can we stay in the darkness? God seeks out to give us light. Thank you.